Ink Paduta and the Scarlet Band. When the United States government stepped in to stop the quarrels between the Sac and Fox and the Sioux Indians in 1830, they established a line between them extending from the mouth of the upper Iowa River to the Des Moines River. The Sioux on the north donated 20 miles to the Strip, and the Sac and Fox on the south donated 20 miles. The Strip became known as the Neutral Ground and became the property of the United States government. The rules governing this neutral strip allowed all tribes to hunt on the land but would not allow any tribe to attack another. All of the tribes obeyed the order with the exception of a small tribe within the Sioux led by Wandasapa. Again, and again Wandasapa crossed over the line and led his tribe against the Sac and Fox until the Sioux Council finally outlawed the warlike tribe. When Wandasapa died, his son, Sidamanadota became Kane, chief of the outlaw tribe. He continued the warlike attacks against the other tribes and sometimes even against his own Sioux tribesmen who tried to stop him. Henry Lott, the outlaw trader. Among the early settlers who were just beginning to come into this western part of the state was an outlaw white trader named Henry Lott. He and his band of desperados sold whiskey to the Indians and stole from both the white and red men. One day he robbed Sidamanadota of a string of ponies, and Sidamanadota chased him out of the country. Some time later, Lot returned to Iowa and again encountered Sidamanadota in Humboldt County. Lot vowed to get even with the Sioux chief. On the pretense of taking Sidamanadota out on an elk hunt, Lot and his son waylaid the Indian and murdered him. Then, disguised as Indians, the two white men went back to Sidamanadota's lodge and killed the chief's wife, mother, and all but two of his children, a boy and a girl. These two escaped to carry the news of the tragedy to Sidamanadota's brother, Inkpaduta, known as Scarlet Point. Inkpaduta now became chief of the tribe, and Lot hurriedly left Iowa for California. Inkpaduta continued to war against his own Sioux tribe as had his father and brother, but now he had added another enemy, the white men as he knew them through Henry Lot. Iowa in 1856. By 1856 a few settlers had moved into northwest Iowa. Arriving just before winter set in, they hastily built cabins along the Little Sioux River. Another small settlement had started near the Okoboji Lake region. These settlements were outposts of the white men's civilization. Fort Dodge, some 80 miles away, was the nearest place where men could go for provisions. The winter was long and cold. Provisions began to run low. Some families survived on cornbread and molasses. While the settlers in the cabins did manage to keep warm, the Indians in their skin teepees were not faring so well. Wandering bands of Sioux came to the cabins in increasing numbers for food and warmth. Sometimes it was hard to get them to leave the fire after they had greedily eaten the cornbread, but to the white settlers they seemed harmless. Inkpaduta at Smithland. In the winter of 1856, Inkpaduta and his straggling band of outlaws, called the Scarlet Band, were wintering on the Adams Farm by the Little Sioux River. This spot was near the little settlement of Smithland in what is now Woodbury County. The warriors of the band spent the winter hunting along the river while the women traded their beadwork to the white settlers for food and clothing. The entire group camped in nine teepees. Mr. James Adams, who was a boy on the Adams farm, recalled, the Indians were quiet and sociable all winter. He remembered that there were about 35 Indians in all and that about 15 were warriors. Inkpaduta's family consisted of his wife and four sons. Inkapaduta wasn't near as sociable as the younger ones, this pioneer commented. He was offish and sullen and kept to himself. He was a little under six feet tall, heavy set and powerful and in the neighborhood of 60 years old. His face was horribly pockmarked, and his hair was red. The other Indians, with two exceptions, were all taller than I. The white men had brought many diseases into the new frontiers, particularly smallpox. Thousands of Indians died from the epidemics which spread rapidly, first through the villages of the Algonquin and later to the more isolated Sioux tribes. Inkpaduta had been a victim of smallpox, and the disease had left deep scars on his face. As the winter became more severe and food became scarce, the people of Smithland suspected the Scarlet Band of robbing their corn supply. In an effort to drive the Indians away, the men at Smithland took the guns away from the Indians and told them that they would not return them until Inkpaduta had agreed to move his band on down the Missouri River. Inkpaduta, fearing the strength of the white settlers, moved on without redeeming his guns, but not south, as the settlers thought, but north. The Scarlet Band moves up the Little Sioux. Moving up the Little Sioux River as the winter snow began to fill the valleys, the warriors of the Scarlet Band marveled at the number of cabins that had sprung up since their trip downstream in the late summer. 
The cabins were all alike, made of logs with heavy punch and doors hung on wooden hinges. Inside, the dirt floor was leveled and covered with prairie hay and a rag carpet, which Inkpaduta's warriors had found made fine blankets. Just north of Cherokee, Inkapaduta saw a sleek herd of cattle and some fat pigs near the Milford colony. Flying Cloud and Roaring Cloud, Inkpaduta's twin sons, pushed their way into the cabin in search of food. Inkpaduta and the remaining braves shot the livestock. The women set to work at once skinning the animals, cutting up the meat, and loading it on their sled-like travoy. A whoop of glee drew Inkpaduta's attention to the cabin. A cloud of feathers billowed from the door. The twins had found the white man's feather ticks and were ripping the mattresses apart and scattering the feathers in the wind. The little band of Indians continued on up the Little Sioux Valley. Near Peterson, Inkpaduta noted with displeasure another new cabin across the river from the Kirchner cabin. He had visited this settlement last summer. He remembered the visit well. Kirchner had two strong sons, Gust and Jake, just about the age of his twin sons. What fun the sons had had with the two white boys, wrestling in the summer sun and shooting at acorns set up in the fork of a tree. Inkpaduta looked over his band. He selected six young warriors, nodded to his twin sons, and led them across the snow to the Kirchner cabin. There would be food here, he knew, for the Kirchners had been kind to them before. Jane Bicknell and Inkpaduta. The snow had nearly covered the tiny cabins of the Kirchner and Bicknell families on the banks of the Little Sioux near Peterson. The winter had been severe, but a brief warming spell had begun to settle down over the little valley. Yesterday a messenger had come up river to warn the two families that the Indians are to Mr. Waterman's. Twenty people were crowded into the Kirchner cabin that Sunday morning in February as the nine Indians came up the bank. For 24 hours the settlers waited in the cabin, singing hymns to keep up their courage. Now the Indians were approaching. Young Gust, peering through the window, recognized his Indian playmates of the past summer. He opened the door and stepped out to meet the visitors. The family dog ran out of the cabin, barking at the hideously painted Indians. There was a shot. They've shot Gust, gasped Jake, the younger brother. The frantic settlers waited breathlessly in the cabin. The door swung open, and there was Gust, calmly ushering in the nine Indians and welcoming them as if they were old friends. Outside the pet dog lay dead in the snow. Jane Bicknell, a young schoolgirl, tells in her diary of Inkpaduta's visit to the Kirchner cabin, Inkpaduta was one of the most hideous things I'd ever seen in my life. The Indians came and searched our house, took all the flour and Indian meal we had. When they began to take the last of the flour, Mrs. Kirchner stopped them. That's for my papooses. And they didn't take it. Mrs. Kirchner remained calm, sitting in her rocking chair with her small children about her. The children's pet kitten, probably the one and only kitten on the western Iowa frontier, mewed loudly. Mrs. Kirchner, hoping to save the kitten from a fate similar to that of the pet dog, quickly slipped the kitten under her apron and continued rocking quietly back and forth. Luckily everyone had turned just then to see another warrior enter the cabin, he was carrying a chunk of frozen carcass that he had cut from one of the Kirchner oxen that had died several days ago. The warrior made signs to Mrs. Kirchner to cook the meat. She rose, cradling the kitten under her apron, and without being seen, tucked the tiny kitten under the pillow on the bed. After the Indians had eaten, they searched the cabin. One warrior pounced upon Gust's best gun and ran from the cabin. Taking all the food they could find, they went outside. They picked up the body of the dead dog and the rest of the oxen meat and departed. But they did not take the kitten. The little pet had slept peacefully under the pillow all during the unwelcome visit of the Indians. Jane continues in her diary, the Indians left. Mary and I started to come over to our house to see what the Indians had done. Saw some more Indians coming down the hill so we went back. Jake and Gust skinned the cattle the Indians had killed. February 18th, Gust and Jake went up to Mr. Mead's. The Indians took Harriet Mead down to their tents and made her stay all night. They threw knives at Gust and put their guns at his breast and said they would shoot him. February 20th, we moved home from Mr. Kirchner's. We found our partition torn down. The tea kettle, frying pan, mother's little wheel and the carpet were gone. February 22nd, Sunday, Jake is here, and I have not much chance to write. I have to listen to stories about the Indians. Jake says the Indians have killed all of Mr. Frank's cattle, took everything they had in their home, emptied their feather beds, broke out the windows and did not leave a thing. Took five horses of Mr. Wilcox's. Ink Paduta moves on up the Little Sioux. With the provisions taken from the Kirchner and Mead cabins, Inkpaduta set up camp along the protected river bottom near Gillet Grove. 
Here for a time, the band enjoyed good days, food for all, and shelter at night. One day a messenger came running across the snow. One of Inkpaduta's warriors had been shot by a white man. Inkpaduta helped lift the lifeless body down from the tree where the white settlers had concealed it. The white men had fled. Inkpaduta, enraged, ordered his band to destroy the settlement. The warriors rushed to their work of destruction, killing the cattle and burning the gillet cabins. Then Inkpaduta and his band headed toward his favorite hunting grounds in the region of Lake Okoboji and Spirit Lake. The women could cut a hole in the ice and catch fish. There might be a fowl or two. There would be only one or two white cabins in that region. Not only was the area a favorite hunting ground, but it was also sacred ground to all Sioux. The Indians believed that the Great Spirit moved mysteriously over the large body of water, sometimes troubling the water, sometimes making the lake peaceful. The Scarlet Band reached the lake region on a cold, clear Sunday morning in March. Inkpaduta stood on the east shore of Okoboji. Across the lake a thin wisp of smoke rose from a lone cabin. His eye swept across the lake. Another cabin, and yet another. He turned and scanned the horizon. White men, they were taking the sacred ground of his people, he strode down to his waiting warriors. He knew what he must do. The white men had gone too far. The Spirit Lake Massacre. Breakfast was to be early that Sunday morning in the gardener cabin, for father and Mary's young husband, Harvey Luce, were going to start out on foot for Fort Dodge to secure enough provisions to last the winter. Fourteen-year-old Abby was stirring the mush kettle at the fireplace. The cabin door swung open. An Indian armed with a double-barreled shotgun, cocked and loaded with ball, stood at the door. At her mother's sharp cry, Abby set another bowl on the table and ladled the hot mush into it. The Indian sat down. Soon the one-room cabin was filled with other Indians, the huge Inkpaduta among them, greedily demanding food. Into the middle of this confusion came Dr. Harriet and Bertel Snyder, neighbors of the gardeners. The two men had walked over to the gardener cabin from their cabin on the opposite shore to give Mr. Gardner some letters that they wanted mailed in Fort Dodge. The Indians were now beginning to leave the cabin and roam around the little clearing. The white men held a hasty conference behind the cabin door. Mr. Gardner wanted to gather all the settlers of the lake region in his cabin, nearly forty in all, and defend themselves. Snyder and Harriet thought this might anger the Indians. The Indians were now driving off the Gardner cattle, shooting them down one by one as they scrambled through the snow drifts. Harriet and Snyder watched them go, and then circled through the oak grove to warn the other settlers. The Gardners barred the cabin door and huddled inside. Two shots interrupted the silence. The Indians had shot Snyder and Dr. Harriet before they could warn the other settlers. All day the Gardner family waited in the cabin, watching through the frost-covered windows. As the sun set behind the far shore of the lake, Roland Gardner cautiously opened the door and stepped outside. Darting from tree to tree, he peered up the lake shore. Nine Indians, led by the huge Inkpaduta, were tramping through the deep snow toward the Gardner cabin. They're coming back! Mr. Gardner shouted as he ran inside. We'll have to fight them off ourselves. Mrs. Gardner, cradling one of her tiny grandsons in her arms begged, don't provoke them, Roland. Let's try being friendly. It worked this morning. Against his better judgment, Mr. Gardner opened the door and admitted the Indians. Flower, one warrior demanded. Mr. Gardner turned to the flower barrel. There was only a scraping left in the bottom. He bent over. A shot rang out. Mr. Gardner slumped over the barrel. The other Indians burst into a wild war whoop. One burly warrior seized Mother Gardner, another Mary. They dragged the women out the door and threw them down in the snow. As they lay helpless, the Indians beat them with the butts of their guns. The massacre had begun. Young Abby had been huddling in the corner of the cabin trying to protect the little loose children and her younger brother. The Indians next pounced upon the children and killed them. But instead of turning upon Abby as their next victim, they broke into a wild dance, breaking open trunks, tearing up clothes, and ripping apart beds. For six days the enraged Scarlet Band, smeared in the black war paint of the Sioux, murdered and plundered the entire settlement, killing 43 settlers. They carried off four women as prisoners, young Abby Gardner, Mrs. William Marble, Mrs. Noble, and Mrs. Thatcher. Charles E. Flandrau, an Indian agent in charge of the Sioux at the time of the massacre, wrote in his report concerning the lake settlement, it was the extreme outpost of civilization. A long and weary distance separated them from the most advanced settlement in Iowa. To the west and northwest of them lay the limitless plains extending to the Rocky Mountains, inhabited only by the Indian and the Buffalo. 
To the north the nearest habitations were on the upper waters of the Minnesota River, a distance of nearly a hundred miles over a primitive wilderness, and the nearest possible point from which protection could have been looked for was Fort Ridgely, a U.S. post on a Sioux reservation, two days' journey by horse in fair weather. Kidnapped by the Scarlet Band, northwest into Minnesota beyond the pipestone quarries, Inkpaduta led his band. During the long marches the three women and the young girl were forced to carry the heavy packs through the deep snow. They were often hungry and sick and always cold. Mrs. Thatcher grew ill. When she became so weak, she could no longer keep up the march, the Indians became disgusted. As they were crossing the Big Sioux River, they pushed her off the log crossing and left her to drown in the icy waters. In the meantime, a white settler, Morris Markham, coming to visit the lake settlement, came upon the empty cabins. He hurried back to Fort Dodge with the news of the tragedy. Many years earlier the United States government had stationed dragoons, who were mounted soldiers, in various forts across the frontier to protect the white settlers from Indian attacks. But later the authorities had felt that there was no longer any danger from Indians in Iowa and had ordered the company of dragoons stationed at Fort Dodge to abandon the fort. Since there were no dragoons, 80 citizens formed a posse and started out across the blizzard-swept prairie. Charles Flandreau, the Indian agent, tells of his first news of the massacre, the first news of the massacre reached me on the 18th of March, some 10 days after its occurrence. Two young men brought me a statement of the facts. These boys traveled the whole distance on foot, through snow, 30 inches deep and were nearly exhausted when they reached my agency. I immediately consulted with Colonel Alexander of the 10th U.S. Infantry at Fort Ridgely and made a requisition for troops. The difficulty that stared us in the face was the certainty that any hostile movement against Inkpaduta would result in the slaughter of the captives. I was planning a rescue through negotiation and ransom. Abby is rescued. As spring came on, the Scarlet Band settled down far into the Dakota Territory. One day two strange Indians walked into camp and offered to buy the prisoners. For a gun, a blanket, and a few trinkets, Inkpaduta sold Mrs. Marble to the strangers. Little did Inkpaduta know that they were the Indians sent out by the Indian agent, Flandreau. The wily old chief would sell only one of the captives, but the two Indians promised that they would return for Abby and Mrs. Noble. Life was easier now for the two remaining captives. There were no more long marches. The women were even allowed to share the same teepee. One evening Roaring Cloud, Inkpaduta's son, entered the teepee and ordered Mrs. Noble to get out. She refused. In a fit of anger, he seized his tomahawk and killed her. Only the 14-year-old Abby was left. It was June before the two Indians returned to bargain for the captive girl. Inkpaduta finally consented to release Abby in exchange for 12 blankets, 2 kegs of powder, 20 pounds of tobacco, 32 yards of squaw cloth, 37 and a half yards of calico, and an assortment of trinkets. The kidnapped girl was free. The friendly Indians hurried Abby off to where they had hidden a team and wagon. With Abby driving the team and the Indians leading the way, they started the long journey back to civilization. Twenty days later, Abby arrived in St. Paul and was presented to Governor Metairie. The governor wanted to adopt Abby, but she wanted to return to her one remaining sister, who had been away visiting at the time of the massacre. On the 5th of July, Abby was finally reunited with her sister, Eliza, in Hampton. Many years later Abby Gardner returned to the Gardner cabin at Okoboji. She purchased the cabin, remodeled it, and made it her home for the rest of her life. She wrote a book about her experience called The History of the Spirit Lake Massacre and the Captivity of Miss Abby Gardner. The state of Iowa erected a tall, needle-like monument just in front of the Gardner cabin in memory of the white settlers. The cabin and monument can be seen today bordering Lake Okoboji. And Inkpaduta? For a quarter of a century the name of Inkpaduta struck terror in the hearts of whites and Indians alike in the northwestern part of Iowa. But the Spirit Lake Massacre cannot be considered an isolated event. The massacre touched off a chain of events that eventually had national significance. In 1862, Inkpaduta joined his other Sioux tribesmen in the uprising in Minnesota near New Ulm and finally climaxed his lawless career in 1876 at the Battle of Little Big Horn, where he helped engineer the ambush of General Custer and his men. Custer's last stand was the greatest defeat that the white man ever suffered against the red man. According to Sioux tradition, Custer was killed by fire belched forth from a Winchester held by Inkpaduta's son, Thunder Cloud. The immediate causes of the Iowa Massacre were the lack of food during the severe winter of 1856 to 1857, and the unfriendly treatment the Scarlet Band received at Smithland and Gillett Grove. 
But underlying these were deeper reasons that set off future Sioux trouble, the resentment at the white man's invasion of Sioux territory, the bitterness the Sioux felt toward the lawless whites such as Lot, and the contempt they felt toward the tricks and treaties of the white men. Like Black Hawk, Inkpaduta rebelled not in the same stately way, but in the only way he understood, as an outlaw. In Inkpaduta can be seen the degrading of the Indian character through certain elements of the white man's culture. As one early Iowa editor commented, many rude and even wicked things take place in the early settlement of a new country, and many rude and unrefined persons find their way first among the wilds of the West. Henry Lott and Inkpaduta represent the worst of both the red and white cultures, and many innocent people had to suffer because of them. The Indians never again molested the white settlers of Iowa. As Kettle Chief's agreement with Dubuque marked the first Indian concession to the demands of the white man, so the Spirit Lake Massacre marked the end of the red man's struggle to keep his Iowa. As for Inkpaduta, he fled with Sitting Bull to Canada, where he died an old man, completely blind.